Welcome back to my parents' house. As you saw in the last video about this property, we replaced the furnace AC combo with a heat pump, a high performance Mitsubishi heat pump. Work is still happening behind us here because we're also doing a number of other things. There are five factors to ventilation that we need to think about as we're planning the performance of any home. Circulation, capture and filtration, humidity control, dilution air, and pressure relief. When we're done with this project, this home, which is a 1960s typical performance home in other ways, will have all five of those things accounted for. All homes need the first one, circulation, which is the ducted system that we've got inside, capture and filtration. Capture is being uh, provided in this house with a kitchen exhaust hood in the kitchen, bath exhaust fans because this is not an airtight house, but filtration is another form of capture. What you're doing is grabbing stuff out of the air so that you can reuse the air because it's got lots of other qualities that you might already like, like it is already warmed or cooled, it is already dried or wetted, things like that. So this is the cheapest way to clean the air in a house is with filtration. This is the filter that comes with the Mitsubishi PV series heat pump that we've got in there. This is not a filter for human health. This is a filter that's there to protect the equipment so you don't get a giant hairball that gets stuck inside the blower wheel. If you can see through it, this is probably a MERV 3 if we were going to use the MERV scale on this. This is the filter that was in my parents' system. This is a washable filter, which a lot of people will think, oh, that sounds good, reusable, I'm being green, I'm being sustainable. The problem is that uh, because it's washable, it's not going to be able to probably grab quite as much stuff as a filter that's going to be more hardcore. The stuff that it does grab is going to collect and collect and collect until you come along and wash it, which of course you need to replace your filter or wash it. But the static pressure drop on this thing, we aim for a static pressure drop to be about 0.1 or a tenth of an inch of water column. The one on this that I tested yesterday before we started this replacement was 0.3. That's three times higher than we would expect a not very high MERV rated filter to be. This is not a MERV 13 people. So uh, this is not really for human health. This is just a more hardcore and also more restrictive way to filter the air. Also, the cover that was on it looks like this. Just got this little handle. You press it in and it kind of friction fits into the filter slot, which means that there is leakage around it. If you could stick your fingernail into a seam, then the blower is pulling air past the filter. It's kind of bypassing the filter altogether. So that can be dangerous. That's why we're going to replace uh, this with this giant cabinet right here. This is 31 inches tall, 21, 28 inches wide. This is the biggest filter that April Air makes. They test their filters. They test their filters for static pressure drop at different airflow set points. So you will be able to tell what this 510 filter is going to do at 200 CFM, 400 CFM, 600 CFM, whatever size air handler you have, they have the number that tells you what to predict it will do. So I actually gave them this one because I wanted them to be able to do MERV 16 filtration if they wanted to. MERV 16 is going to remove 95% of big particles and small particles in a single pass. And that means that I don't have to run the air handler very often to get one air cleaning per hour. I could run it for every 15 minutes or 20 minutes on the hour in many cases. What my father has wanted to do, because they do not have asthma, they do not have allergies, they do not have pets in this house, is you can get the same size filter, but in a MERV 11 instead. So this is a MERV 11 filter, this 510. This is the MERV 16. MERV 11 is the minimum for human health. If you're just trying to be healthy, MERV 11 is the beginning of where you want to go. MERV 11 is going to grab 65% of big particles, 0% of small particles. Small particles are what are created when you cook, when you're cleaning, when you're doing like kind of some stuff that's warming uh, surfaces, which by the way, heating and cooling does that. That's one of the kind of also side effects of this heat pump system is it's not going to warm up things quite as extremely as the furnace did. It'll be a, a milder temperature more of the time. HEPA filtration, which is just past this 516, is starts at MERV 17 to 20 is, is HEPA. That often becomes an incredibly expensive uh, proposition. This unit right here that comes with the MERV 16 filter is about 250 bucks. If you want to take the next leap up into HEPA, you're looking at, for one of the fancier models, $3,000 to start. And that's maybe not even including the replacement filters that you're going to have to deal with. This thing is 100 bucks a pop. 
you're going to be replacing it once every three to six months, not every one to three months like normal. Also, that depends on how often your air handler runs. We keep our handler running 24 hours a day in our house. Therefore, I'm replacing my MERV 13 filters once a month. So now that we're done with the filtration, we need to move on to the third factor in line, which is humidity control. Humidity control, dehumidifier. This is a what's called an OEM. The original equipment manufacturer OEM is Santa Fe. So Brone and Santa Fe are owned by the same company. This is a Santa Fe 120. We had to steal a return from the, you can see this flex duct that's huge. We had to steal that return from the air handler. And now we just basically injected this into the middle of that return. So we're pulling from the hallway in the house above. We're pulling into this, we're drying the air and also warming it, which is one of the side effects. And then we're blowing out here and into the return plenum, which is down there. The one other thing is that we are utilizing the fresh air intake, which is one of the cool things about these ventilating dehumidifiers. We can use uh, the fresh air intake on it, which is a six inch collar down at the bottom, yep. that end on the intake, to uh, hook up to a smart damper. This is a, called a Brone FIN6. It's got an algorithm built into it, a little brain, and it's able to open and close based on conditions outside and what it measures uh, in the incoming temperature. And we can set it up on a timer. So it's like, hey, every 15 minutes out of the hour, I want you to just like open up and let this thing turn on so that it can bring fresh air into the house because the Mitsubishi runs 24 seven anyway. So there's like a lot of if then, if then. Right now we have this disabled and you can see that this damper is completely closed. When we have this enabled, we're gonna need to open this damper. That'll be very important. The last factor is pressure relief, which is makeup air for the biggest exhaust system that we have in any home, which is generally going to be the kitchen exhaust fan. So this is the new one in this renovated kitchen. It used to look like this. Uh, we have the makeup air for this 400 CFM exhaust hood coming up from underneath this range. And the range is useful because it's big, wide open down there. It's just like a bunch of metal pieces and it's made to withstand major temperature swings because of what it is. So we have the fresh air coming up from underneath with an April air supply fan down there. Where the makeup air is coming from isn't like necessarily the freshest place in the world, but it's okay because it's only intended to spend just a minute here while it comes up through this and then goes out through the exhaust hood again. So we keep the circuit as short as possible. That's really important. So now that we have all the pieces in place, let's go ahead and get into the testing of this system and see how it works. I love this filter slot, but this is one of the pain in the butts about it is if you want to measure the airflow through it with a digital true flow grid, which is the right way to go, you have to cut all these extra templates because there is no true flow grid that's big enough for a 31 by 28 filter slot. So <laughs> that's good enough. You want to make sure that it's sealed to the bottom. Also, when the equipment kicks on, it's going to pull. <coughs> against this stuff. So the airflow came out at around 800 and uh, I suspect that my cardboard was not totally uh, forcing all the air through it. The top end of this cabinet, which is the 30, the two and a half ton, uses the same air handler as the two ton, as you can see. So the high speed should be 875. So we're right in range and we're a little bit low on that. And that might be, um, it, it might be part of the pressure, but the pressure at this airflow should be allowed to be 0.8 inches of water column, which is particularly high. We don't really want that, so we'll see what happens. We are about to test the static pressure on this system. When we replaced this furnace AC split with this heat pump, one of my hypotheses was that we would be improving the static pressure a lot because we're taking three heat exchangers, two in the high efficiency furnace and one with the separate air conditioner coil and making it into one thing. So the fan has to work a lot less hard to do all of that. And the duct system, which is probably undersized for the size of equipment that they had in there, when we downsize that, should actually relax and the ductwork should perform better. So let's see. Right now I've got my uh, manometer, which this is a single channel manometer. Uh, you can get this like normal people can get this now. It's the DG8. This number before we had the replacement was 0.324, that's, if we think about blood pressure, that's a high blood pressure. We want that to be around 0.1. Right now we're at 0.135. And by the way, this is with the fan at high speed. So this is the most airflow that we're ever gonna have through this system. 0.13 is a fine number. If we're actually just using one digit, then it does round down to 0.1. 
One of the reasons we got this reduction, by the way, is that we got rid of that AC coil altogether. The coil itself had a static pressure that it was building up of 0.15 almost. So we completely nixed that and we made the system work better. In the return plenum, we had negative 0.267. Right now, we're at 0.17. So we made this number also much better. And the biggest gain that I was really excited about was this filter. We took out a washable filter. That filter put about 0.3 inches of water column pressure on the system. This pressure right here used to be 0.555, which technically by itself exceeded the total external static pressure that the fan was supposed to be able to deal with. So the total external static pressure, which on this unit with the setting that we've got on it should be allowed to go to 0.8 inches of water column, which is kind of a lot, is 0.4 about half that. The ductwork now can work a lot better because it's not having to give up a lot of its pressure to just the ballooning effect of the fan kicking on in the first place. Now we can move the air where it wants to go using velocity pressure. And when we're running the system in auto mode, which is where the fan normally wants to just sit, where it turns itself down, we're running at low speed, which is 0.2 inches of water column, total external static pressure. That's awesome. When we turn on the dehumidifier, which is there, and this brone is ducted into the return right there, which is not the best way to do it. Our total external static pressure does change a little bit because we're forcing air into the return, which is raising the pressure in that return a little bit, so it's making it a little bit easier for this unit to get the air that it needs. It's probably not changing the overall airflow of the entire system because it's giving the air to the system that it would have had to pull from the space otherwise. So it actually improves the static pressure here, but this is not ideal. We don't actually want to do that necessarily because it's giving hot, moist air, or excuse me, hot, dry air, like roughly 90 degrees to the back end of this unit, which takes away its drying ability a little bit. But luckily, because the airflow test showed that we're a little low on this uh, CFM per ton, we're in a drying uh, mode with this fan because we're running it at a little bit lower airflow. So likely we're getting a little bit of an uptick there. So it's kind of like a, it might be a wash. Short answer is there was no way to get the uh, DHU to go into the supply plenum before anything else happened. This thing is so short and it's shoved right up against the plumbing stack, which is right there. So that sewer line is preventing us from extending this supply plenum at all. So we just, we gotta do what you gotta do. It's a retrofit situation and there's always limitations. So static pressure wise, what we've got is I'm able to get in just past the filter here. You can see where we're at. And then I seal this completely up, except for that one little spot down there. Um, and we're measuring uh, in the, this is a, where they have a strap that holds the compressor tight during shipping. You can kind of sneak in there with that. And so with those two added up together, the total external static pressure this thing is dealing with is about 0.2 inches of water column. That's really good. This piece of equipment should be moving about 300 CFM at that set point. And as suspected, we have a temperature that's delivery temperature of about 90 degrees, and it's about 23% relative humidity or well, we're measuring again right in that rear hole there which is kind of handy you should plug those up when you're done testing with them uh, the incoming air temperature and relative humidity would be about 76 77 and about 50 percent relative humidity so that's a, a good improvement and it looks like it is still climbing so we're going to end up around 15 degrees warmer so i'm very proud that we now have on a non-high performance home all five of the factors of ventilation installed and the fact that it works way better than I thought that it would also makes me happy. I've posted that we've had some like issues maintaining temperature, which in a enclosure that's a little bit more bleedy, like I mentioned the blower door test on this house, you're gonna have a little bit more of a temperature variation between rooms. That's why you build an enclosure very high performance first, and then you do all this HVAC stuff. But of course you're dealing with what you have to do. So in a retrofit situation, what you have access to is the machines. So I will have a very hardcore video coming up about enclosures and how to do that right. Um, so please do subscribe. Comment below if you have anything else to add about a system like this or retrofits in general. Tune in next time.